thank you and you may be seated. We'll go ahead and we will dismiss our kids at this time. Well, oh, I'm already hearing the snap, crackle, and pop, so I'm going to try. I may have to change microphones uh, if it keeps up. So, we are in Acts chapter 15 this morning. Acts chapter 15, we are back on schedule. The, the Holy Spirit interrupted us a couple of weeks, uh, or or at least last week, and and, and took us out of sequence uh, in this uh, study in Acts. Uh, So we're back in sequence, and over the next couple weeks, you're going to uh, hear a two-part mini-series within the grand series of the book of Acts, and this week I've given it the title, Church Fights, Doctrinal Edition. Church Fights. Doctrinal edition. I wish I could say that I have encountered church fights that were of a doctrinal doctrinal reason, but nine times out of ten, most are not. Now some people think it's doctrine. They think that because I don't wear a suit and tie when I preach, and fighting over that, that somehow that might be part of their personal doctrine, but it's not biblical. There are people who uh, are upset over orders of worship, and the, the list goes on. Uh, I, I, I have heard of church fights that have gotten so crazy and so intense that uh, this is a true story. I didn't experience it for myself, but... Uh, a business meeting went really bad in South Georgia. And I'm glad we don't keep offering plates, or we we just have an offering box in the back. But, you know, many churches have offering plate on the Lord's Supper table up front. And a couple of guys, in their anger in the business meeting, decided to get up, grab the offering plates, and start hurling them at each other like Frisbees. I wish... This were a lie, but I, I knew the pastor to whom this happened. Another one, I love this one. I, I knew this pastor, but heard the story indirectly uh, from another pastor. Uh, this was uh, in North Carolina, mid-1970s, and <laughs> the, the business meeting turned into a knockdown drag out. I mean, there was just so much hollering and carrying on, and the pastor could not gain control of the room. So after several minutes of it, he got sick of it, and he walked out the back door, turned off the power to the church, and got in his car and left, and that was his resignation. You're like, oh, no, no, that that wouldn't happen in the church. The story gets even better. Well, he... (laughs) He went and evangelized for about a year, and then uh, there was a group from that church that said, Brother, we we want you to start a church. You can't make this stuff up, but the original church had property down the road just a few miles with a cemetery and a building. And the old church... Ah, we're going to need to change mics. I'm going to need to go to the handheld. Uh, The old church gave the new church the building... To start, you can't make it up. I'm going to change to the handheld and we'll, we'll go from there for the rest of the service. Uh, this mic. Mic, mic the mic. Ed, is there any way you could maybe turn down the, because I'm hearing a lot of the reverb from on stage. Thank you, sir. All right. Now I think we are ready to roll. So Acts chapter 15, I'm going to walk through the story and and give the concluding principles toward the end of the message. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Church fights, doctrinal edition. 
Acts 15, starting in verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. You will always, even to this day, find people who will try to add uh, works or whatever and complicate salvation. So this was a doctrinal issue that had to be addressed. Verse 2 says that this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So you could say this is a doctrinal business meeting, if you will. So the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. If there is any time that there should be gladness among God's people, it should be when somebody's saved. I have never understood how churches can shout and clap over all kinds of things and, and then you make an announcement, this person has trusted Christ as Lord and Savior and you hear crickets. Yeah, you, you should be throwing chairs, uh, clapping something because somebody has been brought from death to life. But unfortunately, I don't know, for some reason that doesn't excite some people. But the brothers here, it says, were very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So they were pretty much given a report on the first missionary journey. So they go to Jerusalem, which is kind of considered the mother church, James, brother of Jesus, being the pastor. And, and they're giving this report. Verse 5 says some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. If you know enough about the Pharisees, the Pharisees, they just, anytime they spoke up, it's almost as if you just want to dismiss it because they're always trying to throw a kink in the mix. They act concerned spiritually, but everything they share is just something, it's a distraction to the big picture of what God wants to do. So, they make this statement, oh yeah, the Gentiles, we, we, we've got to put them underneath this bondage. Verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. There were still Jews at this time that had a problem with Gentiles being saved. Sadly, there are still people in the church that don't want certain groups of people saved because they're not our kind of people they might be a different color they, they, they might be a little rough around the edges and the unfortunate part is they're having this I mean this was really a, a racial issue then an ethnic issue Jew versus Gentile and, the, and these guys are having to be reminded, hey, the Gentiles can believe just like the Jews can. Verse 8, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. So that, that seal of the Holy Spirit, that down payment of salvation is available to all. Verse 9 says, He made no distinction between us and them, for He purified their hearts by faith. It's always been by faith. It always will be by faith. Now then, why do you trust or try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke 
that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. In other words, putting them under the bondage of the law. No, we believe, verse 11, it is through gra the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Very interesting here, the, the order. Uh, actually, other versions uh, highlight this a little bit differently. But the fact that the Gentiles, or uh, the Jews can be saved just like the Gentiles. I interesting order. You might think, oh, no, that's, that, that's, that's not all uh, uh, that important. But the plan of salvation is the same for everybody. Verse 12. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Paul, uh, Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking the Gent from the Gentiles a people for himself. I love that. God at first showed his concern. This was all in the plan of God. He didn't want anyone to be lost. So he opens up this invitation for whosoever will. Verse 15. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We don't need to put them under any unnecessary religious bondage. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So pretty much what happens from this point is now they draft a letter. We have to put this in, in, in some kind of organized form because this has been a debate and we have to settle this debate so we're going to formalize this if you will. So now they have it in writing and there's no question about the issue. So verse 22 says, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabas and Silas, two men who were leaders from among the brothers. With them they sent the following letter. And here's, here's the contents of the letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentiles or to Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from, uh, uh, from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And I want you, I want you to notice this very thing in verse 29 was the very same thing that was said in verse 20. This letter is just a, a, a summary of everything that we've covered thus far. And for some, you, you might be scratching your heads on this. Hopefully, I'll, I'll address the issue well enough in just a moment. But verse 29 says, You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. 
So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some time there, they uh, were sent off by the brothers with a blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. You might be saying, okay, Matthew, you have just read 35 verses. What on earth does this have to do with me? It's a story. And maybe for some of you, you might think, oh, well, it's not a very fascinating story. I, 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 like, a little, I, I like stories that are a little more colorful or, you know, wh whatever you might be thinking at the moment. So let me just summarize three main points. Number one, salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. Now you might say, Matthew, we're all saved people here. We, we, have, we have heard this stuff all of our lives. This is very elementary. Why even go there again? Well, the reality is that there are some people who have been sitting in churches for decades Al and I were talking about this yesterday. People who many times carry the checkbook and carry the church power and are lost as they can be. And I'm not going to take the chance and say, okay, well, I'm going to preach the, uh, you know, preach the gospel on my first Sunday as your pastor, and then after that I'm not going to ever preach it again. I am not going to take that risk with anybody's eternity. There are people who watch by Facebook. And I don't want to take that risk either. Because maybe somebody just might be tuning into the message and need to hear that they're sinners in need of a Savior. They need to hear that Christ paid the price for their sin and they can trust Him. Go back to verse uh, 7 of chapter 15, if you would. 15, verse 7. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. To my knowledge, we're, we're Gentiles in this room. Those who that I'm familiar with watch us by Facebook are Gentile people, non-Jewish people. And God has extended that invitation, as I said, to whosoever will. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, these are verses we know well. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Nothing we can do to earn it. You might say, well, Matthew, I've... I've given X amount of dollars to the church. You might say, Matthew, I have given X amount of uh, years of service to the church. I had family that told me, Matthew, I placed my faith in the fact that I just might get to heaven because I helped build our church building. I was one of the charter members. I'm like, I don't know, this, 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 this is going to seem bad, but I thought, man, if you're a charter member, they set the bar low. <laughs> that's, that's for my own family. But he was placing his faith in what he had done physically for the building, for the physical plant of the property there. Not because he had trusted Christ as a Savior. And it broke my heart. And any time you'd share the gospel with, with, with that side of the family, they didn't want to hear it. They were trusting in their good works, and Scripture's very clear it's not of works. Because we don't have any bragging rights. Y'all are wonderful people. I love you. But you are not, and, and I'm not that wonderful to be able to do anything that great to get me to heaven. It took the finished work of Christ and Christ alone. My second main thought here. Salvation is available to all 
who will place their faith and trust in Christ. And I, I've reiterated that already, but I, I want to uh, bring us back to verse 9. He made no distinction between us and them. Doesn't matter if you're black or white, Jew or Gentile, rough around the edges or meek as a lamb. He made no distinction, for he purified their hearts by faith. Salvation is available to all who will place their faith and trust in Christ. But I pointed out a minute ago that there's a reiteration in verse, verses 20 and 29. And I, I'm going to say a lot here. Obedience is not necessary to achieve salvation. I want to be very clear on that because there are some people that misconstrue what I say sometimes. It is not necessary to achieve salvation. It's also not necessary to maintain salvation. I know some people that think, okay, faith and trust in Christ is the entry point for me, but I need to have a maintenance plan. I, I, I need to do certain things to keep my salvation. But I am a firm believer in the security of the believer, that we cannot be plucked out of the Father's hand. And that He is the one. We are kept by the power of God unto salvation. We are kept by Him. We cannot do the keeping. We come through Christ. He keeps us. Thank God. I have dealt with so many people. Especially when I was a hospice chaplain. And they would ask me, well, Matthew. And some of them, they, they, they give me this testimony. Well, I, I was saved on uh, this day, and, and, and then I lost it on this day, and then I was saved and lost and saved and lost about 25 times this day. And I'm thinking, you're wearing me out just telling me your, your testimony. And, I, and I'm thinking it's not even biblical. And it's hard for people to understand because it just doesn't seem fair. And the fact that they... Don't have any control over it. Some people want control over it. They, they, they want to be able to, and I don't know why. I've had people argue with me about it. They, 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 they can't comprehend that Jesus has washed their sins clean. and They just, it's a hard thing for them to grasp. So they think, oh, Matthew, you're being a little too permissive. But we don't need obedience to maintain salvation. But it's interesting in this letter that there are some things that the Jerusalem Council recommends that they do. Not to achieve salvation, remember that. Not to maintain salvation. But there are just some things that are just good common practice. Some people want to say, well, I'm saved, so I don't, I, don't, I don't have to do anything to obey. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy my luxury liner to glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they think, oh, yeah, I'm just I'm going to live like the devil because I'm saved. Obedience flows from a heart that loves God. Jesus said, you love me, you keep my commandments. Some people want to say, well, i you know, they, they, they want to dismiss certain things that Jesus said. But here's, here's my thing. If Jesus said it, we need to follow it. Isn't he our Lord and our Savior? The King of glory? The Son of God? If he said it, we should follow him. Look, look at verse 20 if you would. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of, str of strangled animals, and from blood. Verse 29, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. 
you will do well to avoid these things. Some people would be quick to say, well, oh, Matthew, you're adding works. No, I'm not. I, did, I, I, did, I was very clear. It's not necessary to achieve. It's not necessary to maintain. But they are very clear here. Abstain from food polluted by idols. We say, well, I'm not the one that polluted them by idols, so I can just eat all I want, right? Think about this. If that is going to be a stumbling block to somebody else, do you want to be a stumbling block? I hope your answer is no. Because <laughs> if, if it's not, you and I need to have a prayer time. We should not want to trip up other people in the faith. And there are certain things that are a hindrance. If I know you're struggling with alcohol uh, uh, addiction, I'm not going to bring a six-pack over. I mean, I, I don't drink anyway, but I, I'm not going to bring a six-pack over. I'm not going to bring you a pint of Jack. I'm not going to bring you Jim Beam. I, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I don't want you to stumble. I love you as a brother in Christ. I don't want to put that temptation in front of you. That is the kind of love we should have for one another. And, and the idea here is, you know, the, the Jews, they had been through in, in this system. They had been entrenched in this system for so long. And the Gentiles didn't know that bondage. They didn't know it. So the Jerusalem Council saying, hey, just for good practice, abstain from food polluted by idols. This should be a common sense one right here. Abstain from sexual immorality. But a, a selfish, pleasure-seeking generation wants to totally scratch this out. It's quiet in here. They, they're like, well, my intentions are good. Anybody that's told me that, 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 that their intentions aren't good. I'm just going to be straight up with you. God is very clear that sex, sexual relations are to be between a husband and wife, man and woman. When you start coloring out of the lines of God's boundaries, you bring all kinds of drama into the mix. I don't know anybody who has all these kinds of relationships, says, I, I, I praise God for every one of these. I, not, none of them have told me that to this day. And, and I, I don't think that's going to be the case. It complicates matters. It, it complicates matters psychologically, emotionally. You, you could go on and on and on and on. But we are such a pleasure-seeking Make me happy in the moment generation that this very thing, most people just want to scratch it out of Scripture because it makes people uncomfortable. And I, who, who knows, I might, I might get a blessing, a message from somebody today that didn't, heard this on Facebook, or didn't like it. But, you know, as pastors, sometimes you get fan mail. <laughs> anyway, let me get back to the text. But then it says to abstain from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. And that's that just going back to just being good practice because of, you know, the whole Jew-Gentile. You know, Gentiles, don't, they don't know the bondage Jews do. So just some good practice. You know, I, I already mentioned about, you know, fo following, you know, the things that Jesus shares. You know, a lot, a lot of people get hung up on, well... You know, some people just want to scratch out the Old Testament altogether and say, oh, I don't need to obey that. Well, here, here's, a, here's a good uh, idea if, if these are things that God wants you to do now. Number one, if Jesus repeated it. And number two, if you find it in Paul's writings, Peter's writings, and the epistles. 
if these things are repeated, that, that might be a pretty good idea that God wants you to follow through on those things. The heart of this message, the heart of the debate at hand, was pretty much the gospel message. People fight about a lot of things. And I'm, I'm not one that likes to get involved in all these fights. Uh, so, you know, but when it comes to the truth of the gospel and how to be saved, that's something we should be very clear on. So I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Like I said, as far as I know, most people in this room today, you know Christ is your Savior. At least as far as I know, that's the case. But if you don't, Jesus has given you that invitation today. You need to know, first of all, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you're here today and you say, Matthew, I don't know. I don't know that I die or that I go to heaven. I've heard, I've heard this stuff. Maybe, all, maybe you've heard it all your life. But today, you need to make that decision. Today I choose to follow Christ. Maybe you need to pray a prayer or something to this effect. God, I, I, I know I'm a sinner. I was born with this sin condition, and I've, I've acted upon it quite a bit in my life. But I hear that Jesus died on the cross, paid the price for my sin. I hear that he rose again. Today, I trust him as my Savior. I receive his free gift of salvation. Maybe, maybe that's you. And if that is you, I want to invite you to, to talk to me before you leave. To uh, say, Matthew, today I trusted Christ. Because I want to help you in that in that relationship, to grow, to, be, to become the person that God wants you to be. His Holy Spirit, the moment of salvation, comes into your life. And He'll mold you and shape you. The church is called to come alongside and give you the tools you need. But maybe you're listening and you are, you're here in this room today. And when it comes to this gospel message, maybe it's the best kept secret in your life. You have done a wonderful job of not telling anybody about how Christ has changed you. My challenge to you is don't keep it a secret any longer. Trust. Uh, share that. Share that. That truth. Let anybody say, Matthew? There's somebody on my heart today. Needs to be saved. Anybody? Just by uplifted hand, say. Help, would you join me in praying with me about those people? God bless you. How are they going to know? 
Romans 10 says, how they know unless they have a preacher. Now, I'm not talking about an ordained pastor. You just might be that preacher to share the good news of Christ. Father, I pray for somebody who's under the sound of this message who needs to trust Christ today. Lord, may they do so. For somebody who has trusted Christ today, may they not leave without sharing this good news. But for those of us who know this message well, God help us not to be quiet about it. We need to share. Eternity is at stake. And we don't have time to play around. So God help us to be gospel focused. And may that drive everything we do as Oasis Church. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. Just a couple things uh, before we wrap up. Um, we are starting a men's small group Bible study at Aaron Short's house starting Wednesday the